Welcome to UOA On Demand. Um, I'm Dr. Robert Panulo, and I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Pavli Damian and Dr. Tony George. We are um, interventional physiatrists um, at University Orthopedics, and we are also um, pain management specialists. And the subject this evening is uh, radiofrequency ablation. Dr. Damian, why don't you kick us off tonight with uh, uh, what's your definition of the subject? So with radiofrequency ablation, um, to put it colloquially, we're essentially burning the nerves that sense pain from the facet joints of the spine or the SI joint or the sacroiliac joint. And we use that, we do that using a needle. Um, it's a type of needle that's uh, very specialized in that it's Teflon coated except for the last little tip. And the tip is what heats up as that's sitting on the nerve. So, Dr. George, um, how would you what how would you uh, uh, select a patient for this particular procedure? So, a lot of patients come to our clinic with uh, low back pain, and low back pain by itself could be from maybe we call it mechanical back pain from muscle spasms, but it could also be from the joints in the spine. And a good candidate for a radiofrequency ablation is a patient that has pain that's coming from the facet joints. So typically when we see a patient in the, in the office, we ask them, is your pain in your low back and do you have persisting pain in your back despite whether you're standing or whether you're sitting? Many times we see our patients, they may have pain when they're standing and walking, but when they're sitting at baseline, they may not have any pain. But one distinguishing difference between facet pain uh, as opposed to other kinds of back pain, such as with stenosis, is that they also have some baseline pain, even if it be so dull or low at rest as well. So they have a constant kind of dull, achy type of pain, very characteristic of arthritic kind of facet joint pain. So those are good candidates for a lumbar radiofrequency ablation or even a cervical or sacral uh, ablation. And I would also add to that is that it was a patient that has already had conservative management, uh, for example, physical therapy, chiropractic care, acupunctural care. They may have had anti-inflammatory medications. And I often see this in my practice more so in uh, the senior citizen, perhaps more so than the younger person who would have more of a disc problem. And typically with a disc problem, they're going to hurt more when they sit rather than when they walk. Um, whereas with a facet problem, it'd be more so walking than sitting. Um, and um, um, so Dr. Uh, Damien, on a physical examination, what might you find? One of the hallmarks of facet-based pain, whether it be in the low back or in the thoracic spine or in the uh, cervical spine, so the middle back or the neck, is pain on extension or twisting. Um, and so when you come to be evaluated, you may, you know, we may have you bend forward and bend back, and then we may kind of do something that may seem uh, somewhat strange, but we kind of arch your back and twist it at the same time. And what that's doing is engaging those facet joints, just like any other joint in the body, the facets have a small amount of cartilage in them that with time and with wear and tear can fade away and cause more bone on bone, if you will, in those joints. So then um, we've looked at now what kind of patient, we've looked at what some of their history might reflect in their physical exam. So Dr. George, so now is there any procedure that you would do before the radiofrequency? Absolutely. So prior to considering a radiofrequency ablation, which uh, is which is a the permanent procedure, we do a selective block procedure before. In fact, we do that, that twice. And the reason is we want to select the right candidate for this procedure and avoid any false, uh, false positive uh, uh, from this, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, ablation. So we first select patients and we put them through a diagnostic nerve block where we block these tiny nerves that go to these joints and we see how much of a relief do these patients get temporarily for about a day or two. So if their pain diminishes significantly, about 70, 
then that gives us an idea that they may be a good candidate for the ablation. We do that once and then we repeat it a second time to ensure that we are truly selecting the right patient for this ablation. And when twice we get a successful diagnostic block, uh, that leads us to believe that it's more than likely, we have a high likelihood that this patient is gonna do well with the ablation. And then we go ahead and schedule them uh, for the radiofrequency ablation. The block is generally done with an anesthetic agent and we use two different types of anesthetic agents. One is a shorter acting anesthetic agent and another one could be a little longer acting. We don't tell the patient which one we're gonna use, but then we, we see how the patient responds by giving them a pain diary where they log their pain before they had the procedure and then they log their pain at different intervals after they had the procedure uh, and for us to see if they did fit the criteria uh, or do fit the criteria for the ablation. So I agree with you, Dr. George, um, but I would also add that it is an insurance company requirement uh, um, that the um, two preliminary injections are done first before doing a, uh, uh, getting authorization for a radiofrequency procedure. Um, so then once we get that authorization and we're uh, set to do a radiofrequency, Dr. Damien, how would you go about doing it? So typically a radiofrequency ablation is done very similarly to the nerve blocks. Uh, we use an X-ray machine to guide our needles and place our needles, which are very specialized needles that are insulated, except for a 10 millimeter tip. We place them on the outside of the spine in where we uh, know the medial branch nerves, which are the nerves that sense pain from the facet joints where they reside. Uh, after doing some motor testing to triple check that we're in the right spot, um, and that typically involves patient participation, we go ahead and numb up the area and we inject and we go ahead and lesion the nerve uh, for about 90 seconds. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so Dr. George, take us from there. So after you complete the procedure, the patient uh, goes uh, back home. It's the same day procedure. It takes about 15, 20 minutes of the most to do it. So it's a fairly uh, um, um, straightforward. It's not as complex as the name may sound. Radiofrequency ablation may seem kind of daunting, but it takes us about 15, 20 minutes to do it. After they go home, uh, we do a follow-up in about uh, you know three weeks, three, four weeks. We like a little longer follow-up. It's uh, a little different than doing an epidural injection where you, we do a two-week follow-up, because sometimes it does take a little longer for the nerve uh, to realize the effect of the nerve. So during follow-up, you uh, you ask, uh, uh, we ask our patients to see how they feel, and, and we assess to see how their back pain is at this time after the procedure. How are they feeling when they stand and walk? How are they feeling when they sit? Uh, is there that dull, achy pain that they describe? How much of that has been addressed? How are they going about uh, their daily activities? Are they able to do their activities at home and, and uh, outside even within the community? So we look at uh, uh, those aspects, the pain control aspect as well, and also the functional aspect. Now, Dr. George, when you do your procedures, um, I know many physicians may do it, uh, may add a, a steroid and may, some may not. Do you, in your procedures, do you uh, add steroid after you've done the radiofrequency? Uh, I may or may not do. Sometimes, uh, most times I do uh, use steroid. Uh, the reason being that uh, you are ablating the nerve or the primary objective is to ablate the nerve, but Sometimes you can get residual inflammation around the surrounding tissue, which is the, the soft tissues and the muscle around. So the pa patients could complain of uh, some associated spasms there. So uh, I have now resorted more to doing the uh, steroid uh, injection after. It's not a lot, just a little bit, just to uh, help with any uh, uh, discomfort immediately after the procedure. But it has no I, bearing on the, on the uh, ablation itself. I asked that question simply because that's something in the beginning of my career, I did not use steroid as, uh, but I, as I've seen some patients may get a post-procedural inflammation. So I typically will use some steroid unless of course it would be contraindicated in that patient. So then Dr. Damien, oftentimes patients will ask me, 
what are some complications that you could get from such a procedure? But I would ask you in this way, what steps do you take to try to avoid any sort of complications? So one of the biggest steps that we do, um, well, two big things we do. We use x-ray guidance. We make sure that the needle is where it needs to be on the outside of the spine. Um, and also we do what I kind of referred to earlier uh, as motor testing. What motor testing is, is we run an electric stimulus that the patient you know, feels as a twitch. And we ask the patient, where is that twitch? Where are you feeling that twitch? Typically patients may feel nothing or may feel a twitching in the back or in the buttock or in the neck. That's very normal. And that's actually a really positive uh, sensation because it really lets us know that we're right where we need the needle to be. Sometimes patients anatomy throws us for a little loop. And so that motor testing helps us to make sure that there's not that the patient's not having any sensations down the legs or into the arms when ablating the neck. And that gives us that extra added safety in preventing any lesioning of the nerve that we was not intended. Dr. George, would you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think uh, uh, Pauli summed it up pretty well um, in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, answering that, yeah. So then I would say in general is that one of the most common or reasons to go to a physician in the United States would be back pain. And so therefore that's kind of a, uh, a wide area of, of possible diagnoses, one of which would be a, a problem with the facet joints as arthritic joints are, are quite common. And therefore I, I recommend to people who have back pain it may be coming from the facet joint, and I encourage you to come to University Orthopedics because we um, physicians may be able to uh, help you with this uh, uh, problem in a non-invasive, uh, non-surgical way.